So here we are. Seth, I am so curious to hear what you make of all of this because I can't tell if it's just a media frenzy around some Ivy League schools who have the luxury of denying the majority of their applicants. Yeah. Or if there's actually going to be this huge shift back to requiring test scores in the coming years. Hit it! That's what I'm talking about. Wait! Okay, now, from the beginning. Hit it, boys. Welcome to Higher Ed Pulse, your Monday morning energizer covering insights and trends in higher ed marketing and enrollment. I'm Mallory Wilsey, bringing over 15 years of ed tech and marketing expertise to your earbuds. And I'm Seth O'Dell, joining the Pulse with my own adventures from leading marketing at top universities to founding Canahoma, one of the industry's fastest growing digital marketing agencies. Each week, we bring you the kind of insider insights you typically only find over cocktails with your pals at a conference. It's fast, it's fun, and it's designed for you, the busy higher ed professional. You're not just listening to another podcast. You're checking the pulse of higher education. Higher Ed Pulse is part of the Enrollify Network, a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher ed professionals like you grow. Explore our other shows at enrollify.org. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Pulse. Hey, Seth. How you doing today? I'm doing great, Mallory. How are you? I'm great. I'm actually gearing up for a lot of conference travel. Weren't you just somewhere recently? Yeah, I was actually at my first conference this year, which was the CCCU conference, a Council for Christian College University. So only the first of many. I think I am like hitting the conference circuit hard this year, at least harder than most. But you and I are going to catch up, I guess, really like next month, right? Because we're both going to be, you're coming to San Diego for ASU GSV? I can't wait. I have not been to this conference before. We're doing both the air show and the summit. Actually, Enrollify is going to have a really big presence at both doing some live podcasting and stuff. But I get to actually hang out with you in real life. Like, are all my dreams coming true? It's been, honestly, it's been a long time. Like, we have not, like, IRL'd in a while. And so, one, I'm super excited about it. And two, I'm excited for you to experience the conference. I've been going to ASU GSV for, I think this is my, it could be my fifth or sixth year. It's a great one. But I'm hoping to see you on some of your stopping grounds, too. I was, you know, I'm going to be back on the AMA circuit. Uh, and then I actually was just looking, you know, by the time this airs, High Ed Web may have closed the proposal window, but I did see it's just a little bit still open. So, you know, I'm still kind of making my calendar plans for the year, but hopefully we cross paths multiple times. That is my objective. Minimum of once per quarter, please. I like it. It's official. Quarterly IRLs. Done and done. All right. Well, friends, you know we just get right into it. And today's topic is on standardized testing. So in early February, Dartmouth College announced a reversal of their undergrad test optional admissions policies, and it made some waves. A couple weeks later, Yale followed suit, and they announced a test flexible policy. And I'll note that MIT actually reinstated their testing requirements back in 2022. So this is, you know, causing the media to stir a bit. And folks are scratching their heads, you know, like, why why did Dartmouth do this? Well, they did some research on their own student population, and their study found that test scores are a better indicator of college performance at Dartmouth than other factors like grades or essays or even recommendations, but particularly for marginalized students. And this study also found that their test optional policy was not increasing the proportion of less advantaged students in their application pool. I have a feeling, and Seth, I I know you remember this. I'm sure many of our listeners do too. There was this big wave in the early 2010s toward test optional admissions, and there's still advocates out there for this shift in policy. And, and typically, these advocates are pointing to three things about why test optional is beneficial for everyone. They point to, first, uh, that GPA is a better indicator of college success. Second, that these tests are discriminatory, particularly for students of color who have less access to test prep resources or even college credit bearing courses in high school. And then third, that a test optional policy will result in a more diverse student body. And coming out of the pandemic, you might also recall that the entire University of California system actually went test blind because 
after the pandemic, they were able to measure 2020 and 2021 results that both racial and socioeconomic diversity increased. So all this new research is really interesting because it's kind of countering each other and a lot of the arguments that the advocates have been putting forth, right? And so if Dartmouth's study is indicating that these test optional policies are discouraging applicants from submitting scores that would have actually benefited them in the admission process, especially those from those disadvantaged backgrounds. So here we are, Seth, I am so curious to hear what you make of all of this, because I can't tell if it's just a media frenzy around some Ivy League schools who have the luxury of denying the majority of their applicants. Yeah. Or if there's actually going to be this huge shift back to requiring test scores in the coming years. Yeah, it's it's a really good question. You know, I think the first headline is obviously just like confusion abounds. Like it is just wild how much folks' opinions are differing. Even the Dartmouth data, you know, where, where are the sources for that? A lot of folks are, are citing sources for their own institutions, you know, and one institution doesn't necessarily make an industry. I think the key things for me are one, the reversal is real. You know, we went from a place that was really feeling like the decline of standardized tests was sort of set in stone, both prior to the pandemic and then obviously going through COVID. And now we're at least seeing that the elites are reversing some of that. And so I think the question for us is like, you know, are rumors of the SAT death greatly exaggerated? Are we going to let the elites lead? Are we going to let them leave when it comes to, you know, a test optional or test blind approach? And there's also been good questions that have been raised about whether or not test optional or test flexible actually do more harm than just requiring the tests in the first place. If the institutions still, you know, reward people that are providing test scores, even though they make it optional. And so, you know, I am not uh, an academic, and so it's probably not my place to, to be able to weigh in on exactly the correct form of assessment when it comes to like how best to understand an applicant. But I will say one of the things I looked up with this topic was, you know, the overall SAT rate, 2.2 million students took the SAT in 2020. It dropped to one point. 7 million in 2022 and a lot of us thought okay this is this is happening and it jumped back up to 1.9 million in 2023 and so we are still pretty far down from where we were a few years ago but it seems to be recovering and so I worry for the market I, if I was a parent of a high school student if I was a high school student I don't know what to do do you take these tests do you not take these tests and so that that is the biggest concern for me is you know it depends where you're trying to apply everybody's different and so one of the things about standardized testing at least historically is they were standardized and so so there's now no longer a standard. And I think that's the confusion we're feeling. And we can get into a minute about the impact on us as marketers, which is significant on the list buying side. But more broadly, I would just say, I worry for folks. Confusion abounds uh, when it comes to this reversal on everyone's POV on standardized tests. Absolutely. And I, clearly, right, students from more advantaged backgrounds have not stopped testing and submitting their scores to colleges. And we know that plenty of things in the admission process are, you know, quote unquote optional. But to get into an elite school, applicants do have to go above and beyond. And just because a school says they're test optional does not mean test unimportant. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I can tell you, Seth, you know, I worked for a four-year school that admitted about 60% of its applicants. And we were not test optional at the time that I worked there. But the only time those test scores really mattered was when they were wildly different than what you'd expect after looking at that student's transcript. And, and that goes in either direction. No decision ever came down solely to the performance on those tests. But again, we were admitting nearly two-thirds of our applicants. That's a really important. I think there's this interesting trend about standardized tests suddenly becoming a lot less standard and really no knowing to do. There's this broader world happening too with the reality that beyond the results of those tests being utilized or not, as you just shared, you know, in making an assessment for admission, there's also the sense that that realistically marketers and enrollment professionals are utilizing list buying that's primarily based off of these standardized tests. So these standardized tests are large organizations that historically have sold those names and what we've seen over the past several, really five or six years, is a total decline in reliance on list buying. And so this is in particular one I'd love listeners to, to weigh in on LinkedIn or find us online is I'm so curious if how much list buying has shifted for your institution because you know, it was 2018 or 19 when College Board stopped capturing religious affiliation. So for private faith-based institutions, right off the bat, you no longer could target for that. But in the past year, we now have an FCC ruling that's requiring single brand consent, which means you can no longer take someone who's taken a test and then sell that list 
to everybody. They actually have to opt into the individual brands. And so what we're seeing is this upcoming year is going to be like the hardest year ever for list buying. And so, you know, to me, it's hard to talk about standardized tests just from admission and not worry about, you know, how it impacts marketers too, because historically that this was such a primary form uh, of like input for marketers looking on who to target. And essentially list buying, I think, is just really melting as a strategy uh, for marketers in higher ed. You know, we're not going to cut this out. It sounds like your dog has a lot of opinions about this, too. I was hoping you didn't hear that. But yeah, that's Gigi. She's doing great, as everybody can hear. She is just barking up a storm. (laughs) Sorry about that. We've had the pleasure of seeing Gigi in a handful of video clips that we have posted to LinkedIn. And it's actually a bit sad that uh, we're not getting a little Gigi sighting today, Seth. Yeah, you know, maybe that's the issue. That's actually, she's probably trying to break in and get her voice heard too. So you are right. Uh, We need to do that. Hey, everyone. It's Mallory. I'm hosting the Engage Summit this summer in Raleigh, North Carolina. The theme of the conference is AI Got You. We're not just talking theories. This conference is your guide to understanding and applying AI at your institution. By the end, you won't just get AI you'll be ready to lead your campus through an AI transformation. It's for everyone who wants to use AI to level up everything you're doing. Whether your focus is to recruit or retain, the Summit offers a platform to learn, network, and bring back actionable insights to enhance your student engagement strategies. I hope you'll join me and some of your favorite Enrollify creators in Raleigh on June 25th and 26th, like Jamie Hunt, Dustin Ramsdale, and Allison Tercio. Use the discount code Enrollify50 and you can register for just $99. So join us at the Engage Summit this June. Learn more and register at engage.element451.com. We can't wait to see you there. So let's get back to standardized testing. I don't know if I'm convinced that, you know, Dartmouth is uncovering all sorts of diamonds in the rough as they're, you know, correlating all of this information. But let's talk about why this matters to marketers. So you've brought up list buys, of course. If list buys going away, like what's what's the alternative? That is such a great question. I actually have had two people bring that up to me this week, actually. And so, you know, one option is digital marketing, but targeting folks that are under the age of 18 is actually quite challenging and it differs by platform. And so, you know, there is a, an okay amount of targeting that you can do on Meta. It is more limited across other platforms. You know, Snapchat lets you target down to 16, not 18, you know, uh, in a deeper way. And so like every platform is different. And so there is some of that targeting, but the, the concern that I have is that it turns into a lot more of like lookalike model modeling, meaning you have to utilize your past data, which means that we're going from an era, the one thing of good thing of list buying is it was a little bit more scientific, at least measurable, more controllable the institution. And we're moving to, to options for outreach that really require a little bit more trust in the platforms. And so to me, in particular, it's digital marketing, uh, as Gigi, my dog in the background, agrees. And I'll just say there's options to win there. You know, we're, we're driving sub $100 cost per campus visits with one partner. It's possible, but it's new. And so to me, engaging students in a more meaningful way online is something that we have to figure out how to do sans lists, or at least to complement them, because I don't think anybody in higher ed would take the side that list buying is going to grow in propensity and importance, especially as the confusion around whether or not standardized tests should stay or should not continues to um, kind of spread across the, the whole market. Puts more pressure on the RFI form on the institution's website, for sure, because you have to be able to capture the email address. You you just look like you've got something to say on this, Seth. No, I'm so. You, I just think it's such a huge point, Mallory. That historically, institutions have not used RFIs for traditional high school students. It's really the RFI itself has really been much more of a tool for adult or online. And the idea was that you're just going to push high school students to an application or to a campus visit. And the most institutions that I talk to are not staffed to do proper outbound, like whether it's calls or custom emails, they're doing automated outreach only to high school students. And like we're seeing more and more high school students are, to your point, filling out the RFI, they're having questions and like it is a necessity to be able to capture that information early and work it. But I actually don't think a lot of our industry is structured or staffed to do it. There is an awesome episode over on Talking Tactics uh, about optimizing RFI forms, and I will make sure that that gets into the show notes for listeners. 
So, I mean, this is a big topic and there's a lot to, to think about. And it's way beyond marketing enrollment, right? These decisions are made at an institutional level and we're often impacted by that. To me, the biggest thing is is twofold. One is, are we being intentional about this? My concern with seeing elite institutions reverse back into a prioritization for standardized testing is that others will follow without intent, meaning that like, you know, where the elites go, the rest follow is a common theme in our industry. I hope that's not the case. And I also just hope that marketers have a seat at the table to make sure people understand more broadly how the way we recruit high school students is being totally disrupted. Like between the less students taking tests and the recent FCC rulings on single brand consent, like the fundamental foundation of traditional high school recruiting is really, really shaky right now, and it's not likely to get better. And so while one debate is happening on the academic side of the house, another is happening in marketing. And I just hope all folks are intentional and they're making decisions that are right for themselves and their institution, not just maybe following the headlines. And I'll add one thing, regardless of the decision that your institution makes, our job as marketing communication professionals is to make sure that we are being as clear as possible with the audience about what is required, what the expectations are, how that information is or isn't being used. And that is not just those of us sitting in a central marketing office, but it's all the way down to the individual admission counselors who are on the front lines and talking to these students at their high schools or at college fairs or interviewing them on campus, right? Everybody is going to need the talk track regardless of what the decision is. Let's switch gears quickly. Uh, I believe it was maybe our very first episode of The Pulse where we highlighted a viral post that caught our attention on LinkedIn. And we haven't done that in a couple weeks. But very recently, one of our other Enrollify creators, Dave Kibbolds, posted on LinkedIn. And Seth, I know you and I saw this immediately and we're like, oh, we f- the, the, it hit the feels for us and it also hit the feels for a lot of you, given that there are more than 40 comments on this post and 3,600 plus impressions. So what was it? Well, (laughs) Day was lamenting about how she misses the laissez-faire way we used to post multiple times a day on Twitter and that these LinkedIn posts now just feel so serious and that if you post back to back, it can feel like a faux pas. She was channeling her inner French woman. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> with this post. But I mean, gosh, Seth, I miss it too. Like those early days, that's when our friendship was cultivated. I used to tell you what I ate for yeah. lunch every single day, <laughs> every day. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. I, I miss it a lot. I think the absence of Twitter into X is real. I mean, I'm, I'm still active on there slightly. I, I obviously respect anyone who's not any longer it, LinkedIn is not it. Like it's a, it's a LinkedIn is its own place with its own, um, you know, dialogue, which is great. You know, Instagram for me is more personal life. You know, Facebook is now mostly for family. We're missing this extra place, especially a place where we can also, I would say, not just share like more informal personal insights, but also content. Uh, I, I used to, er, in the early days, where when you and I were like, you know, really besties on Twitter, which at this point I'm at like 13, 14 years ago, it was link dumping all the time. I saw this article, I saw this podcast, there was a volume of like um, friends sharing content with friends that like I don't get anymore and it's missing. And so I resonated with her post because like I feel the, that vacuum too. And I, I feel like uh, it's just unfortunate we don't have a place to, to kind of converse like that. Yeah. One one of my colleagues replied to her post and was like, you know, where do I go to just vent now or like get that thing out of my head and yeah. have other people kind of react to it. Like that ideation doesn't happen on LinkedIn. And I totally agree with Day. It's like, I feel like I get my one post on LinkedIn a day and it's all or nothing. You know, like if I post more than once, I actually notice that the algorithm like kind of limits the reach. It does. Same. It punishes you. It literally does. I've noticed the same exact thing. The only place where this kind of dialogue is happening, I think, substantively is in Slack. And those are closed communities. And I don't know anybody else. I'm so slacked out right now. And so it is not open, which by the very nature was what made like Twitter great. Met so many wonderful people, yourself and, and dozens of other folks that I didn't know. And so that idea of discoverability is lost. I don't know. Maybe we like maybe someone needs to build it. Let's say maybe we need to build it. We have a lot on our plates. But like I've thought about building something. Like like I like I 
needs to be built. It's not like it just has to happen. Someone's got to solve it. There's room for one more and uh, to get back to basics. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe someone will step in and do it and we'll find ourselves in a different place in a year. I hope. Day, you hit a chord with us. I think you hit a chord with folks on LinkedIn. And man, if anybody has a solution, Seth and I are itching to. <laughs> yes, big time. Tell you all about our sandwiches. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. I'm ready. I'm ready to post. Uh, whenever the platform arrives. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Well, just like that, we are already at the end of another episode. On Thursday, we have the second pulse check on personalizing the student journey. Yours truly interviews Dustin Ramsdell. It's a great conversation. Actually, I think this is the second of three of these episodes. And I, I would say the second one's my favorite. So even if you don't listen to the other two, go, go listen to that one. It's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We can't wait to see you again next week. Bye-bye. The Higher Ed Pulse is part of the Enrollify Podcast Network. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows, too. Our podcast network is growing by the month. And we've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our show helps higher ed marketers and admission pros find their next big idea and features a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Brian Gross, Eddie Francis, Jenny Lee Fowler, and so many of your favorite leaders in higher ed. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful and personalized interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.